So yes, only 84 days to go. And uh, yeah, I'm not sure that they're trying to win or trying to lose or what on this one, the way they're both candidates are approaching it, but we'll get into that in a minute. Uh, but Clearly, the markets have wobbled in recent weeks, uh, but have remained quite resilient. I don't know if you saw Japan is back up close to where it was, uh, its market before its big sell-off last week. The U.S. has rebounded quite well. Um, the U.S. economy is displaying uh, remarkable resilience in spite of the problems we're facing in the world today. But market volatility has risen and is likely to stay elevated through the FOMC meeting in September or more likely through the November election and maybe beyond. Right now, investors are being forced to uh, assess the impact of an unusual number of market moving issues since the end of June, from President Biden ending his reelection campaign to the assassination attempt on President Trump, uh, Vice President Harris moving to secure a historic bid for presidency, renewed fears of a hard landing, which were a big issue at the beginning of last week. And then you have the expanding uh, war in the Middle East with an imminent threat of a, a attack from Iran on Israel. You have Ukraine taking the fight to Russian territory, which is the first time there's been a incursion like that from a foreigners since World War II. Um, and you have the ongoing struggles of China, and then you had the carry trade um, issues uh, and the market's reaction to all the above. So there's a lot to digest, um, which has been a distraction from uh, the election a little bit. Um, uh, so it's easy for participants to get caught up in all the short-term issues and all the things going on. But when we step back and look at it, we think a lot of the events of the last week were more market-related than uh, economic related. And a lot of that goes back to this path to normalization that we've talked about for most of the last several months about moving off of zero interest rates and going to back to more typical interest rates. So we're in that process. You have a lot going on right now that's going to uh, derail the focus, but I think there are some mega trend issues that are presenting really once in a lifetime opportunities if you're investing in the leading industrial energy defense and tech companies, particularly on the tech side, those that are going to be enabling the productivity increases are gonna be necessary around the world. Yeah. So that said, we have a, a election a couple months out. Uh, Trump and Harris are uh, really statistically um, uh, too close to call. Harris has made a, a pretty impressive shift since uh, she came in. But the question I have is, um, is the honeymoon coming to an end? Is She hasn't really laid out what her policies are going to be. Um, she has highlighted some shifts that she's uh, making from maybe past positions that she had. President Trump has really struggled. And if you recall back in early July when it looked like Harris was going to get the nomination. I said, one of the keys for the election is going to be who defines Harris? Does she define herself or does Trump define her uh, candidacy the way he's defined other uh, rivals? And he struggled to define her so far. And she's done a pretty good job, I would say, of positioning herself um, without giving a lot of specifics on any of her policies particularly as she's shifting some policies from what she had um, stated in her brief run for the 2020 presidential uh, uh, Democratic nomination, which she dropped out basically uh, a month or so before the uh, Iowa primary. So she didn't really get a chance to have her policies vetted. So we're still kind of unclear on where she stands on a lot of issues. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that. So I say this a bit tongue in cheek where they stood a week ago because um, every day they seem to have a new view from both candidates. Um, on immigration, Harris has shifted her views considerably. I think she's trying to separate herself from being viewed as the border czar. Ironically, um, she did before her candidacy um, shift to where she thought we should have a change in the border policy from Biden. Um, but it's not clear what that shift is going to. Trump is in the deport millions camp, um, which I think is gonna be harder to do legally than uh, he'd like. 
from a fiscal discipline side, neither one has done anything to suggest they're going to even attempt to rein in the deficits. And as you saw with the mention on waiving uh, taxes on tips and Social Security, forget about the whether you think they're good or bad social policies. Economically, there's no offsets to those increases of spending. Um, so how does that play? How does that play out? I think um, on the third rail issues of Social Security and uh, Medicare, neither one's done any has given any indication they're going to. Um, Rain in the deficits, and the idea that tariffs are going to be the answer to upset any tax issues we have is uh, flawed economically and has been for in many different ways. So, really, not a lot of difference in terms or clarity in terms of where they stand on on taxes. There is a bit more clarity. Harris plans to raise them on the wealthy. Um, Trump has said he'd like to lower uh, taxes uh, for corporations at overall. Um, so one big dividing uh, point. I think the really interesting dynamic on a geopolitical side is Harris and Biden have not done much to deter enemies, and Trump has been hostile to allies. So we're really in a very funny spot geopolitically. On trade, they're both talking about tariffs. Trump may go even further and undo decades of trade liberalization. I'm not sure either one of those policies is going to be particularly good for the economy. On regulation, clearly the view of increased oversight versus reducing oversight is a big dividing uh, point for the two of them. I think this is a big issue. And uh, I saw an interesting report that said um, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was 28 pages. Recent acts are much more detailed with a lot of other stuff thrown in and a lot less focus on any one area. But a lot of pork thrown into them. So I think the Affordable Care Act was over a thousand pages and some of the more recent legislation has been 5,000 pages. So we're adding complexity to a system that makes it harder to do work and it's slowing down some of the things that the Harris and Biden administration has tried to get through, such as their infrastructure spending in other areas. So another area of significant difference. Um, I think regulation is one of the areas that is holding the U.S. back. We can be over-regulated. I think there's a balance between proper regulation and over-regulation, and we have to try and find the right thread the needle on that. I'm not sure either one of the candidates does that. Hello? When it comes to the Fed, I think there's a real um, issue here. Harris favors independence. Excuse me, Depender. Although she didn't vote for uh, 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 Powell when he first ran, Trump came out with one of the most amazing remarks I've heard in some time, thinking that he should, the president should have more say because of his success in finance and in investing. He's more qualified than uh, people at the Fed and uh, as well as the chairman. I can, I would have loved to have seen the faces of two people when they saw heard those remarks. Um, I can imagine Chair Powell shaking his head, uh, smiling, shaking his head and going back to work. And I can see Larry Summers, who's been very vocal about this, whose head probably exploded at the time when he heard those remarks. I think the Fed independence is absolutely paramount to uh, a good running economy in the U.S. Um, you can criticize the Fed for making mistakes, but they make mistakes that are not political. They make them because they get stuff wrong. Uh, on the economy because things change. But um, I think this is going to be one of the really interesting areas. Right now, uh, there have been some interesting surveys all in conflict. So I would say the margin of error on most of the surveys is so close that um, I don't think I would, I would uh, put too much stock in where the numbers are right now. But it is interesting what the issues are that people are pessimistic about um, they're very negative on economic conditions and they feel they're worse off uh, since Biden became president. Ironically, Harris polling came out that she could handle the economy better than Trump, which is unusual because nobody really knows what her economic policies would be. But I think it's just interesting and part of the honeymoon phase that we're in. I think this is really an issue of who's defining themselves better. And so far, Harris has done a good job of defining herself um, where Trump's attacks have not worked very well and have fallen actually flat or actually turned people off. 
where neither one of them has talked about substantive policy issues. They've been more making personal attacks and and making calling name calling as opposed to moving the needle here. But I think we're still in the Harris honeymoon period. I think you'll start to see some shifts um, now that you're going to have to lay out what the real policies are, and then you'll have a better sense of where people stand and what impact it's gonna have on voters. <clears throat> I still think the two big issues are cost of living in China. Um, I think Trump is viewed as stronger on both. He was very early on the China is a problem issue. Uh, and he has done, a, I think, a, gives people a better sense that they would be better off with him financially. I'm not sure really either one of their policies would make anyone much better off. I think the economy ebbs and flows are going to be what really drives it. But there is the risk that their policies do take us down a path that could be quite detrimental to the economy. If it is about the economy, then the swing states are gonna matter even more. And if you look at it, the swing states in terms of real per capita GDP change is not in the favor of uh, the Democrats right now or the current administration. As you can see, swing states have only seen real per capita GDP at a 4.2% level, uh, well below the rest of the US, and that is not gonna work in favor of the incumbents. So where do you invest in this type of environment and where are the best opportunities? And as Mark knows, I've said for some time, you want to follow the money to identify it. The Inflation Reduction Act, the CHIPS Act, and the National Defense Authorization Acts are driving capital to the U.S. It's really important that we keep in mind that the corporate capex that continues to be spent is being backed by not only federal but state and local spending. And we are seeing as a country, a lot of capital flowing because of our economic strength, the reserve currency status, our energy advantages, our capital markets advantages, but really the safe haven status that we've seen. Um, but I think this issue of um, we're doing all this and still trying to figure out how generative AI and climate transition are actually gonna impact our systems, both globally and domestically. So let's take a look at some of these and why, where we think there's still money to be made in the markets, included in spite of all the sloppiness. So this is public investments driving activity based on the Inflation Reduction Act, the uh, Infrastructure Act, uh, the CHIPS Act and the like. And you can see both public investments very high. This is uh, all levels of government backed by private sector investments in critical areas. So. Uh, semiconductors, clean energy, batteries, biomanufacturing, heavy industry, and clean power are all attracting capital and are seeing money flow, but it's not a straight line. And it's been reported in the FT yesterday that the industrial projects from the uh, from the acts that uh, fiscal stimulus that the Biden administration's put through, and these are for projects valued at least $100 uh, billion, are having different uh, levels of success. Uh, some are operational, but a handful. Significant number are on track, but a lot have been delayed or paused. For us, this means delayed gratification in most cases because suspending is going to continue, but there are problems. There are problems in planning. There are problems in pushing this some of these policies out. Um, and some of the areas that capital is flowing to, some of the states are not benefiting because they have either labor issues, permitting issues, energy issues, water issues, or weather issues that are creating some delays and some challenges. So there are risks to the, uh, to the process that we're looking at here and how many of these projects get sidetracked or delayed. But we think the spend in these areas are non-postponable in most cases and will continue to go along. You'll just delay the inevitable that the spend will come through over the next several years. And you can see some of the areas that are getting hit and, and what those, uh, you can see some of the weather challenges that you might have in Texas or in, uh, or resource uh, issues in Arizona. Um, but there are other issues around. Are you finding the staff? Are you getting the permitting? Those are the types of things that are slowing things down. I would not overreact to this. I think the problems of putting this much money into the system in a short period of time are going to have these types of fits and starts. But the idea of having a long-term industrial policy to drive things forward is really critical to how we, how we get out of the uh, 
the process we're in of getting the economy back on track with manufacturing coming home and getting more sustainable, more secure uh, manufacturing uh, growing in the US. I also think you wanna keep an eye on capital flows and there's some really interesting dynamics going on here. I showed these charts a couple of weeks ago, but they're worth keeping in mind. We are seeing strong foreign investments coming into US equities from outside the US. We're also seeing strong demand in the bond market as well. And interestingly, there are discussions between senior officials at the uh, uh, US and Chinese uh, finance areas looking at currency swaps and other things to help deal with potential issues as we get into possible liquidity squeezes. So they are looking at things to make sure the US and China manage through what could be some turbulence in the markets. Um, so that is something to keep an eye on. But what's interesting is as much as China's pulled back on their demand for treasuries, you've seen inflows from the UK and other areas into the US that are uh, driving capital flows back the other way, which speaks to the US as a safe haven economy. I'd also point out that China for the first time in some while has had significant outflows in foreign direct investments of $15 billion last month. And that trend comes at a pretty tough time for China where they're trying to increase capital coming in, increase consumption. You wanna keep an eye on that as well. So I said there's a lot to happen between now and the election. Um, several key events need to happen first. So we have CPI that was reported. You have uh, the Democratic Convention. You have Jackson Hole. You have NVIDIA coming out with their results uh, uh, end of August. You have uh, uh, payroll data coming. You have CPI uh, coming. And then you have the Fed meeting. Uh, all to come. You have another Fed meeting on November 7th, 6th and 7th, and then you have uh, the December Fed meeting. Right now, there are rate cuts uh, implied by the market at each of those three meetings. As of yesterday, the uh, futures market had the next meeting with uh, uh, voters about split, whether it's a 25 or 50 basis point cut. I think the reaction of 50 is an overreaction to the volatility of the markets, not to the underlying economic uh, outcomes that we're seeing. We think the economy is more resilient and stronger than uh, the fear that's been in the market lately. And we think that the Fed will keep an eye on that. We think that central banks are also focused on some inflationary pressures that are coming back into the system through wage increases and other areas that are of concerns. And if the Middle East blows or some of the uh, other events that geopolitical events that are going on around the world could see a spike up in energy prices and also some more challenges to shipping that could increase some of the inflationary pressures. So again, the last uh, from three to 2% is not a straight line, is gonna be some challenges. And I think the central banks are gonna be more focused on seeing data trends rather than data points uh, to move forward. So volatility through the election, maybe beyond. Um, you are seeing already the groundwork being laid for uh, election tampering. You saw that last night with the uh, Trump-Musk issues. They're starting to lay the groundwork for that. I think the uh, our expectation is that you have a, a post-election rally. It may start with the Fed easing in September but you'll have volatility up to the election and then you'll see things when we have greater clarity start to move forward. I think the market focus on the short term is real and it is masking some of the best opportunities out there. We like industrials, we like energy, we like defense and we like uh, the productivity generators around tech. We are less concerned about the valuations right now of some of the names. We think this market pullback has given you um, some easing of some of those pressures, but. We think the spend that's going on is really going to be much more enduring and gives you a better sense if you look out the next three to five years and see the companies are gonna benefit that way. So we think there's big opportunities to move forward. Uh, so Mark, I'm gonna stop there. I do think that the candidates could do a lot better job of laying out their policies to give people a better sense of how you should invest around that. But absent that, um, I'm not sure that they're going to do that until the last possible moment. 
And it seems like the Harris campaign said that you should hear about their economic platform in a couple more days, although uh, they're going to have to come up with something for the DNC. But um, I think a lot, a lot to happen before we get to the finish line. So I'll stop there, Mark, and open up for commentary and diverging views. Diverging views. All right, commentary, diverging views. Questions, comments? Mr. Blanco. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Stephen. Um, my question, two questions. The first one, black swans, what do you what do you see as potential black swans between now and November for the election? Um, I get the sense that geopolitical is is one that you're concerned about. And the second question is, you mentioned 15 billion um, capital leaving China. What is, how, how does that happen? What is the nature of that capital? How are they get, because they've got very pretty strong uh, capital controls. Those are my two questions. Yeah, I have to, I have to get the details on how they got them out, but this is reported yesterday um, in the FT. And uh, I think it's a lot of, uh, foreign money that's just uh, reversing where they were. And you can get it out through, I think they use um, uh, transactions through like-minded countries to get it back out the other way. It's kind of the reverse of what the sanction beaters are doing. Mm, okay. um, uh, as far as black swans, um, I think the issue that could create, I think where you could see an issue created is the another currency problem that stems from the uh, yen unwind from last week that could lead to some currency distortions in Europe. Uh, I'm sorry, in in Asia, as the interconnectivity of economies plays out. Um, but that's by definition black swans, as Jim pointed out, are unknown. So uh, that would be a gray swan. Is is I think the the elements of attacks. Um, of a war breaking out in you know, in the Middle East, I think the uh, I, I suspect that um, the big debate between the National Guard and uh, uh, the more the president in Iran is how far do we go? Uh, do we go after attacking a military person, kind of tit for tat, or do they bring in civilians on the attack? And I think that's kind of the determination of how it blows up in the Middle East. Um, but I think those are the the big ones. I, I think the what you're seeing in Russia, and I'll throw this back to you, I, I suspect this is all in uh, uh, posturing for a negotiated settlement um, uh, because I don't think they can keep expanding, but it, it, it does speak to the vulnerabilities that uh, Russia has with their border more broadly about the future of NATO and, and Europe's actual ability to weaken Russia if they got their act together to do so. What well, a comment on the Ukrainian uh, incursion, I would say that, yes, it is partly a negotiating tactic, but it's also something that's been going on for two years. The uh, the um, counteroffensive that was supposed to take place last summer and was delayed largely failed because of the delay in getting weapons to the Ukrainians. The Ukrainians were looking for a weak spot in that 1500 kilometer uh, front line for a long time. And the interesting part of that is that front line is heavily fortified in as what's called the Sudovikan line, where you have dragon teeth, then mines, then you have the entrenched um, Russian soldiers. Long story short, it is thinly, thinly manned. You've got, Russia has 90, 95% of its uh, active soldiers on that line. And they found a weak spot in Kursk where they did the incursion. So that's forcing the Russians to send uh, troops to there. So we may see another incursion or several more incursions as opposed to the go in and come out. This one appears to be much more 
much more sustainable. Now, how sustainable can they hold a thousand kilometer square kilometers of Russian territory? We'll see. It's a fascinating approach. They're taking a big, big military gamble. Well, they're fighting for their lives. Yep. Bill, you want to switch gears or? No, just uh, so we're not. switching gears going back. Um, huh, a commenting question. So on on the comment side, it's it's interesting to indeed watch the polls, and uh, I, I I hope people haven't done what I do, which is like click too many times on recent polls, because then all of a sudden your feed gets overwhelmed by it. It seems as though things are are changing all the time. But I, I've been noticing kind of an interesting diversion uh, between some of the polls, and particularly if you look at Rasmussen, uh, they're 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 a little bit on the other side of where you're seeing a lot of the polls coming in, and also some of the polls uh, have been holding off. Uh, some of the stuff in real clear politics is is a couple of weeks old now, so it's it is interesting. Um, so. Fair, fair and balanced, uh, you know, one other resource there. But then um, question, uh, question, Stephen, on the defense side, which you've been banging the drum for a long time, you know, to your credit, what what do you think about, you know, kind of the Lockheed Martins, you know, versus the newer upstarts? And and how how are you seeing that as, as, as an opportunity? So? Well, the big guys, it's, you know, they're, they're entrenched with the government and they get it, it's hard to work through the government to get stuff done. So the big guys have a embedded advantage right off the bat. Um, but the upstarts have been creating some really interesting products. So I suspect that um, that you'll see continued consolidation in that area because the big want to get bigger like they are in all the other areas as well. Um, and the government wants to deal with fewer people, not more. Um, Although, Mark, we could get back uh, uh, Siptarsi, uh, who yep. works with the uh, uh, DOD, the NIU, uh, out of New York City, where they are promoting Venture Bill. And yep. uh, he did some really interesting stuff there where um, they are promoting through 12 regional centers around the country. The Department of Events has these innovation labs to promote the technologies that we need to get. So I think you're seeing the DOD trying to raise up their efforts in that area um, to get more innovation going. But I think the big companies are still gonna be the big companies because they have the embedded advantages, uh, ties into the government and the processing and the programs that they can add these things into. But There's I think it's a, this is it's interesting with the dynamics of the world today. You want to be, in our view, overweight energy industrials materials. And those are not areas that people are typically overweight. And in the S P, the defense is less than two percent. I think energy is around six and industrials all in is 15, and defense of that is probably uh aerospace and defense is 2.6. So the weightings in most institutional portfolios versus the problems, I think, are mismatched considerably. Carolina? Yeah, a slightly different question. So just uh, I would be curious about your opinion, Stephen, about the recent news about the Berkshire selling almost 100 billion of, st uh, of stocks and not reinvesting it. Uh, so does that make you concerned about the outlook of the U.S. markets and the economy is that? Would you say it's an indicator of a weakening U.S. market and economy? No, I actually think it's more a, a risk management approach. Buffett's stake in Apple is still eighty-five billion dollars or something like that. Um, uh, so it's not like he uh, he and he wasn't reacting to the recent quarterly the this quarter news that, that sale was predominantly last quarter so i think he looked at his position and said you know a apple has spent a lot there at a point now where he's done exceptionally well his timing was really good but he's still holding a very healthy position so mm -hmm. our view on that is uh when you trim and don't sell out completely you're 
planning on the stock to keep going up. And uh, that's our approach. I'm pretty sure that was Buffett's. Um, on B of A, I think he probably realized that um, that B of A, uh, I think Brian Moynihan's out in favor of uh, um, more aggressive rate cuts. So I think he might've had some insight that B of A might not be particularly well positioned uh, right now for some part of their portfolio, but I don't know. But I suspect his it was valuation as much as anything for him. And in Apple's case, it was risk management. So I'm not worried about that. I actually think the US uh, was due for a pullback. We were overbought um, and this pullback is quite normal for, for us in terms of where we would be when you had a 20% return in six months just made no sense to pull back. It made sense that there had to be some pullback before we can move forward again. We do think the year will end up higher. And I think the 56 to uh, 5,800 is where most analysts are. I have seen some still as high as 6,100 right now. So I think that people will are not as negative on the markets. And a lot of, a lot of what I think people are hoping for is just the Fed cuts to bail them out and increase multiples where we view this is going to be an earnings driven market. Um, I happen to think Apple might be one of the best position companies to take advantage of chat GBT, but it won't be right away. It'll be another year or so out. How, how so? Uh, they have it a bit, they have a unique ability to take the technologies and put them into real life applications through their developer network that can get into the system and they can monetize it that way where a lot of people are creating products and looking for solutions. The developers create the solutions for Apple and then they use their services business to take their piece of the action. Um, so they have a bunch of people working on it for them to get it into their system and then they leverage it the best that way. I think they, they have a good positioning for that. I think Meta is probably has done a good job of finding ways to apply technologies. I think Microsoft will also do a good job in that. I think they'll do it differently in each case though. So I, I'm we're not as concerned about the fits and starts that are going on there. We do think, I did see Gartner saying that 30% of the AI initiatives that are uh, underway in companies today will be canceled in two years. So there will be a lot of money wasted on this along the way. I just think that Apple's history and Meta's history, and I think Microsoft's history of taking technologies and applying them is going to be the difference for them. I also think their balance sheets are very different. Uh, I would just say for all the fears that were around last Monday and Tuesday about the market melting down and the tech bubble bursting, uh, and then people were making comparisons to 99, the big difference is the companies that we're talking about now that are the leading companies have massive, strong, world-leading businesses that are generating incredible revenues Back in 08, 09, there was virtually no revenues coming out of these. There's certainly no earnings, and these guys are earning massively. They have fortress balance sheets, which they didn't have before. So I think that's a very different environment uh, than what we're looking at back then. So I think we're kind of applying history inappropriately in some of the cases here. Other questions, comments? Bill's back. Bill, we, we, need, we, need, we, need, we need to talk about Survey 17, too. So I'll talk about yeah. that. Well, well, maybe this, maybe this is a good segue. But I I think it's it's probably worth noting that in the last survey that we did, there was more consensus for no recession amongst the community than, than ever, you know, since we started asking that question. And then, of course, last Monday, where you had, you know, sort of the soccer unemployment, like, you know, people like completely freaked out, uh, you know, the carry trade unwind notwithstanding, but uh, people were very, very apprehensive about the potential for a recession, you know, for that. So this is, this kind of gives us a very interesting observation. Is the, is the community like, you know, do we have the inside track on this? The, yeah, we're probably going to be okay and you shouldn't get too excited about things. Or is it a contrary indicator? 
So I'll I'll kind of I'll kind of leave that out there. But I think it's it's an interesting question just to, to go back and think about you know how do I think about a recession at this particular point in time? Uh, you know, yes, no. If so, if not, then what are my what are my potential options? It'll be interesting, Bill, to see the change from the last survey to this one based on the headlines. Yes. Because we don't, we don't see a hard landing coming unless there's one of the major issues like Adam was highlighting of a, a full-on war somewhere or a, a real currency blow up that spreads like we had with the Asian crisis back in 97, 98. Um, I, I would agree. I think also, uh, you know, there are plenty of banana peels out there, you know, not the least of which on the macroeconomic side things you know tightening has just been crazy and conditions are quite tight you know despite what what people might think about it so we're we're kind of walking a, a very thin line in my my thinking right now we also had 15 years nearly 15 years of a market that was fully supported by central bank policy of zero interest rates and quantitative easing and we're going through a process which people don't like processes or transitions because they are an immediate gratification. But when you're going through a process of normalization of rates, like the central banks around the world are trying to do, it's going to be painful for people who are stuck in the old mindset of we're going back to zero. And I think that's going to be the one of the biggest challenges for people to get their mind around is that short of a major crisis, if we're going back to zero interest rates, you don't want to be a lot of our investments that we're waiting on to work out will not get the multiple expansion. They'll be wiped out um, because that'll be a sign of a really bad economic problem that we can't get out of. Yeah, I I, I think uh, I think you're spot on there. That 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 may be like the supreme irony that if if we go back to zero, you know, you're going to get something that you really don't want. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, again, Mark, the, the slide that you just hit on in terms of, you know, what concerns you there, uh, there was more of a consensus around apprehension, uh, despite the fact people were, were pretty solid on no recession, there was still apprehension that was being voiced in the survey. Uh, yeah, uh, question? Yeah, Mark, hi, good morning. Um, this is more of just, I just sent a, uh, uh, a note there for everyone. Uh, if you're not aware of the Financial uh, Crimes Enforcement Network uh, requirement, uh, it, you need to register your LLCs and corps by the end of the year. And there's pretty hefty fi uh, fines for not doing so. Um, so if you don't know about it, the, the link I put in the um, text box there or the message box for everybody to take a look at. Uh, is that widely known? It's uh, they're supposed to start advertising it and trying to let people know they got to do this. Uh, but it was something I read something like five hundred dollars a day after the first of the year if you don't register. Anyone want to comment on that? Well, it's not all LLCs, just those that are in the investment field, correct? Uh, no, I believe it's all LLCs is uh, what uh, my research showed. There are some exceptions, but basically all LLCs and, and corps. Um, and it becomes, it's a, it took about a half hour for me to do two of them that I have. And it becomes easier when you actually apply for uh, a... Uh, ID, uh, a FinCEN ID, and then you just sort of click on that as you're filling it out for each uh, LLC and corp that you need to do. All I, all I put it in there is to encourage people to take a look at it and see if it applies to them. But I do believe it applies to the vast majority of LLCs and uh, corps in the U.S. So just want to share that with uh, folks, uh, Mark. Well, we're, I was just talking with Winston and Strawn yesterday where we're going to do our Chicago event. And I think it's sort of high time to finally do a, a legal tax pre-election and post-election. 
Sure. Michael Hammer. So just commenting on FinCEN, um, from my perspective, it's dumb. I already have to file for my company with, along with my 1120, I have to file Schedule G with beneficial ownership. And, you know, it's kind of duplicating what you already have to file. So why they can't exempt folks who are doing certain filings makes no sense to me. It's just more work. Of, um, of course. And, you know, Mark, if you do a, uh, a legal, if you will, uh, session, that's the type of thing that could come out. Maybe, you know, uh, that there are some exceptions or, or whatever that would help folks. But going back to Stephen's presentation, um, one of the interesting things I'm seeing locally where my farm is, and um, it's a deep red county. Um, and since uh, Biden stepped back and Harris is the nominee, um, there seems to be a lot more anger but it's still focusing on Biden. Name a problem and folks are blaming Biden. Um, whether it has anything that the presidency can do or not. So I just find that uptick in, in anger um, very interesting. And I don't know what that necessarily means for the election, given that this is a deep red county. It's interesting. The, uh, the 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 point you're raising is there's two big issues that people are upset about. One is cost of living, and two is immigration, and those are issues that really are getting laid at Biden's feet. Whether they should or not doesn't really matter. That's where they seem to be going. So, the challenge for uh, Vice President Harris is: can she separate herself from that? or have policies that will correct that to change the anger or redirect it? Well, I mean, just as an example, um, a lot of folks here, because this is uh, oil and gas country because of the Utica, people follow the price of oil, they follow the price of gas. Someone posted about the $7 jump in the price of oil, and immediately people were blaming Biden for it, which really it had nothing to do with him, right? Um, so it, it's just kind of interesting seeing that sort of stuff. Yeah, fair enough. Duncan. Stephen, I had a question for you. Just, I'm I'm sort of looking at some big picture stuff that's really different now than it was three or four months ago. Um, I don't know if you guys saw this thing, B. Riley. You know, they've just taken this huge write off, and basically, you know, they had a credit bet embedded into their, you know, probably less than diversified merchant banking strategy, right? And then um, there was also an article. Um, in Bloomberg last week, I think it was August 6th, on another credit manager that was um, really struggling. Let me just see if I can find it. And anyway, um, I'm looking at that and seeing, you know, that all the fears were like in people were worried about the embedded credit risk in bank portfolios, which are actually quite public in the report quarterly, right? And then what we've got is this world of sort of private credit that isn't really reported, uh, or in B. Riley's case, they, they claim it wasn't reported properly, and these private credit managers aren't really compelled to report things. But, you know, there's clearly some stress showing up in parts of the credit market that aren't very transparent. And then the other side of the trade is you look at, you know, Home Depot earnings just came out today, McDonald's last week. Any of these companies that are really touching the sort of, I don't know how to define it, the bottom 60% of the income earners in the States, they're really, it's its really crystal. Oh, you know, defaults on car loans, right? I mean, it's just crystal clear. There's serious stress there. And I'm like, the, the Fed cutting rates a quarter of a point or even a half a point, it's not going to solve 
any of those problems. So I'm, I'm just, you know, I look at that and I say, and you, you know, somebody asked the question, what's the black swan event? And I'm sort of like, geez, there's a lot out there that says it's really not very pretty. And I just wonder where this, I mean, it wouldn't shock me if the whole thing just rolled over. You know, I mean, there's a couple things out there that just, it seems like we're just relying on the top 10% to keep spending and we, that's going to stop us from rolling over. But in, that isn't, what is, I what is rolling I, I just over? throw that out there. So, Duncan, what does rolling over look like? Well, rolling over is you get negative GDP growth, you know, you know, people basically say, I mean, like, let's suppose, you know, we, we got this market, you know, going back to the financial crisis. I don't know if you guys remember this, but you, there were there were a couple like late 2007, I think it was or early 2007. Right. Market had a couple really shitty moments. Right. Everything was like really going gangbusters. Everybody's happy. But a couple sort of market events happened. And people kind of brushed it off, you know, and then all of a sudden, you know, you got into September of it got of 07 and it got a lot more serious. I mean, people don't want the good times to go away. Right. They do their best to hold the thing up. But that was a pretty shocking trade, you know, the first three days in August. Now we shook it off for now. But if that thing had sustained itself, the, the, the high net worth people would stop spending money. Right. If you if you. If you had that thing last another month and really, you know, really shook up the bank accounts, I mean, people, that's what happens, right? That's really, so anyway, I don't, I'm, I'm sort of meandering around here too much. I'm just, um, I'm struggling with this, what I feel like is a little bit of complacency on, uh, on the Fed's part. I mean, on the one hand, they're not at the 2% target. I, I see that. On the other hand, moving 25 basis points isn't going to fix either of those two issues that are blatantly out there in in the marketplace. And I just, I don't know, just throwing it out there for discussion. So not cutting rates, they've already lowered mortgage rates. Mortgage rates have come down almost 100 basis points. Exactly, yeah. So they didn't have have to make a change in the rates that come down. So I think the market is going to do some of the work for them. But I also think that the numbers can be misleading. Because uh, auto revolving credit versus mortgage credit is very different in terms of scale and size. And actually, if you look at um, their uh, home uh, loans, uh, they're actually uh, seeing uh, homes as a percent of disposable income or their home loans as a percent of disposable income have come down quite a bit a couple percentage points. And that's a much bigger market, a much bigger part of the portfolio. So that's one element. The other thing is the haves and have nots are real. We've talked about it a lot. And I think a lot of what you're seeing is um, in those numbers is low end consumers who got overextended, who thought the zero interest rates are gonna go on forever. Um, That's not a big driver for the market. They tend to overspend spend the full amount that they, they earn. It's really what happens in the middle class. So I, I think as a consumer economy, you look at the wealthy have over half of the uh, $157 trillion of net worth in the country, they're fine. Um, a big chunk of the middle class is going to pull back their spending, but it'll keep spending. So I think the economy keeps moving. I think who, who wins and who loses gets shifted around, but I don't see the the concern that you're citing, unless there's some real big blow up in the system that we're not seeing right now. See, Jim, Jim and Michael and Bill, but um, Chaz, is there a reason you put prospect capital in the chat? That was, that was the the name I was referring to in the Bloomberg article. I see. Jim? Yeah, just a couple of observations. Number one, because, and, and I'm sure Stephen, you do too, watch, the credit market like a hawk. And uh, we're really just not seeing stress in the credit market yet. Yes, some of my private credit friends tell me that there's a rise in non-accrual among some of the private credit funds, but certainly the public market, um, notwithstanding a little uptick during this latest little conniption, uh, spreads and yields are still very much under control. 
And, um, you know, be careful what you wish for if you want the Fed to reduce rates, because if you look at history, uh, the, the end of a Fed hiking cycle and the beginning of lower rates uh, tends to coincide with uh, bad economic conditions and the stock market going the wrong direction. They, it usually starts with a financial crisis, too, which we don't have. We have the fear of financial crises right now, but we don't have one. So I think some of this is the market getting ahead of itself there. But I think you're right, Jim. I don't think it's as bad as the headlines make it out to be right now. Well, I think I think the point I was trying to make is, I mean, I'm not sure what the numbers are from the U.S., right? But the European credit high yield market, for instance, right, it's 20 percent smaller than it was a year and a half ago. So what's happening is these loans that used to get done in public markets that gave you transparency of pricing were all out there to be seen in the index, right? Now what you're getting is you're getting sort of a technical situation with markets that haven't grown the way they were supposed to. So they trade pretty tight, even though there's stress. And where there is stress, it's in an opaque market that nobody's pricing. Then so that's that's the question I'm really asking. I'm not saying the Fed should be cutting rates tomorrow. Right? I'm just throwing this thing out there. I think there's like this a, a significant opaque portion of the market that could be sneaking up on us. And the two signs of it were, you know, B. Riley and the uh, as Gary put in the end, that story on Prospect Capital. You know, they were like the beginnings of the story starting to get into the news flow. Bill can speak to this better, but I think they there had. We did go through a series of covenant light loans being put out uh, into the market that will come back to bite people um, who didn't do their credit work. Um, but I think there's problems underlying in individual credits without question. I'm just not sure it's a systemic issue at this time. Michael and Bill. So my questions to Duncan, given your concerns, and the way that you expressed them, have you gone more defensive? Um, I basically put in like, like stop losses in like between April and May this year. And I just figured on individual things I own, I was happy to just sort of, you know, if I get stopped out, take some money off. So I definitely raised some cash. And then what did I do like last week? I, I spent a little bit of money on Monday, but it's not like I bought the Mag 7. <laughs> yeah, it's like, <laughs> I, I don't know. I try to figure out what are you supposed to do? Um, I'm, I'm sort of asking these questions because I'm kind of lacking the conviction that everything's going to be okay and the market's going to rally back. I just sort of feel like there's some signs out there that make me wonder. So I don't know. Um Five and a half percent is not bad earning cash, right? That was my logic before. And if it goes down to, if it goes down to four and a quarter, you know what? Who cares? Four and a quarter, five and a quarter. I don't care. You know, if you just want to be in some cash, I mean, you don't have to be invested anymore, especially if it's in a tax-free account, right? Because I mean, it'd be nice to be invested when when things scream back. So, uh, my response hey. to you is. I, I generally try and keep about two years of spending in cash equivalents, fairly liquid stuff. And so the market goes up, the market goes down. It's not as concerning to me. Sounds Bill. No, no. Very, very, very good advice, Michael. And I guess, yeah, Duncan, to your to your question, uh, you know, I I think when you when you look at private credit, kind of bifurcating it into the sponsored loan versus the non-sponsored loan market, and I don't know, I've been beating this drum for a while, but I think one has to be very careful in the sponsored loan market where all the big guys are playing. The competition is so fierce, you know, up there that they're they're driving the you know the the balance of power has already moved over to the borrowers from the lenders. That's not a good sign. Uh, you know, the trend towards covenant light has been in place now for a while. 
uh, the lender on lender violence, uh, you know, that's happening when things, you know, do get a little tight. Uh, so I, I think you, you do have to be careful about that. Um, in the kind of lower middle market, uh, non-sponsored loan market, I think, you know, those seem to be okay uh, so far, but I think that, you know, as far as Canary in the, in the coal mine, you know, that's probably, you know, where you really need to pay a lot of attention because if some of those loans uh, start going bad, I think that that's more of an indication, you know, that, that things could be rotten in Denmark. Um, one of the other things that, that I wanted to mention, and yeah, Mark, I don't know if I can share my screen, but it's super quick. Yeah, yeah, you can. Go for it. Yeah, can you all see the the uh, Federal Reserve back in Atlanta? Yeah, so I've got up. I just want to. This is something that I've been thinking about for a while. It's like, you know, how's the consumer going? Because consumer is driving GDP, has been, will do, uh, on ongoing. But if you look at if you look at this, um, this is wage growth tracker. We had, you know, from 2010, so post GFC, all the way up through COVID very nice rise in wage growth. You know, that means a lot to the kind of segment that Stephen's been pointing out. And then of course, you know, we had COVID and then all of a sudden all the checks came out and it just like skyrocketed. But since July of 2022, we've been on a downward trend as far as wage growth is, is concerned. And it, and that's that's tough because then, then you get you get bit from from both ends. Uh, you know, your wages are going down, and also the prices that you're paying are going up. And you know, once again, you know, in, the rate of inflation can move up and down, but the but the effects of inflation are cumulative. And so, you know, once again, you know, Stephen's credit, the, this whole notion of, of cost of living is something that is it's continuing to tighten around the lower income brackets. And, and that's gonna to be tough. And when it starts moving up into, you know, the real engines of, of growth and employment, you know, small business and small business owners, you know, that's gonna be that's gonna be a tough go. So I think those are additional kind of canar uh, canaries in the um uh, in the coal mine to be looking at. But but this, you know, this wage growth decline is fairly significant, you know, coming down from, you know, 6.7%, we're now down below five to 4.7%, uh, as far as growth. Well, I would just add in the, in the swing states, in many of the counties, the numbers are even worse than this in terms of their lagging behind. And that's one of the challenges, I think, that the uh, Vice President Harris is going to have of is addressing that issue in those swing states that people weren't better off in the last four years because of that. So I think that's the uh, one of the hurdles that uh, Vice President Harris is going to have to get past to win those swing states. Totally agree on that. So, uh, William, your chart, is that wage growth or inflation-adjusted wage growth? These would be nominal. I, yeah, I don't see I don't see any reference to real wage growth. And the positive, you know, I, I think if if you if you do look at the real wage growth, you will see that it has been positive for a while. But and and the trend is certainly has been that. But I think that that's a lot of hangover, you know, from when rates were lower. So I think now we're it, it's. It's probably barely positive at the moment. Um, yeah, that would make sense because if, even if at uh, at high four percent range, so if you look at the the current inflation rates are about two percent. So you know net net real wage or nominal wage growth at, at four, you know four almost five, inflation at two plus three, you know something around those lines. You know that that subtraction is still positive, but again, you know 
the, the cumulative effects of inflation are far more insidious than just, you know, real rates versus nominal rates. And Bill, I think for the last two years, the, the lowest income people have had the highest wage growth rates and it's the middle class that's really being impacted negatively by the chart you just showed, not the low end consumer because they are seeing bigger raises come through. Um, just with the minimum wage alone increases have driven up the low end uh, wages considerably, but it's still not enough necessarily to deal with the cost of living challenges that they're having, which is where the frustration is coming from. Right, right, yeah. And I, I think too, just, you know, if you look at, it, at some of the articles that have been coming out about Kind of what's been going on with employment. I think it was either today or, or yesterday in the Wall Street Journal. Um, a lot of the tech jobs uh, are, you know, are are drying up, and the marketplace is certainly a lot less frothy. Uh, I I can I can real time data point. Uh, my my son is in tech and in cybersecurity, and you know before it was a uh, it was it, it was a seller's market in a sense. You know he had he had a lot of options and mobility. The last thing he told me, he's like, Dad, I think I'm gonna stick around for a little while. It's like, okay, good, you're not salary shopping again. So yeah, I, I think that's a lot more pervasive than uh, just in this particular segment. Although they will get hired, but they'll get hired at much lower pay yep. when they move because everyone's trying to build their tech up so they can improve their productivity so they can lower costs and not pay as much in wages. Yep, absolutely. Well, it's 1207. Thank you, uh, Thanks, everyone. Mark. Thanks, everyone. Another great conversation.